for anyone who might have just come in and uh, maybe not be familiar with the uh, Wild and Scenic Study Committee and the people in it, I will introduce myself. I'm Eileen Fielding. I'm the executive director of the Farmington River Watershed Association. And uh, we uh, deal with a lot of different aspects of the river. I have to do a lot with river management, but also uh, there's a lot of local interest in river history. And uh, we were talked into some months ago putting together a program on the history of the Farmington River, which is a very tall order. And I'm not claiming that this is at all a comprehensive history of the river. Um, this is a sampling of river history as put together by someone whose expertise is in the river, not in the history. So uh, with that disclaimer, um, I can get started and also invite people who are here who may know a great deal more about certain aspects of river history than I do to please chime in, you know, wave, ask questions, uh, make corrections, um, or otherwise participate in this presentation. <laughs> okay. So um, history happens here because the Farmington River is a river and rivers tend to be um, central features in their communities for a lot of reasons. Um, in fact, doing a presentation on the history of the river, it really is hard to figure out where to start because there are so many ways that the river is used. You know, what part of history do you start with? What aspect of river use do you start with? Where geographically on the river should you start? Um, but um, I really did decide that the primary natural resource uh, is something that I'm going to mention in a moment here. Um, as I just mentioned, the, a river uh, provides many natural resources, and we'll get into most of them uh, shortly. But uh, one of the most spectacular ones on the Farmington is the Salmon Run. And we all know the Salmon Run no longer happens, except for a very few fish every year. But we've sort of forgotten what a major, major natural event that was on uh, the rivers of the, the northeastern seaboard. If you take a look at the little fish uh, in the lower right here, um, the one on the bottom there is a salmon fry. Those are hatched in the rivers. They grow up uh, after a couple of years to be par, which is the next biggest fish there. And when they reach the size of smolts, which is uh, the biggest little fish there, they go out to sea. And they'll stay there up to four years. And when they come back, they have brought an incredible natural resource with them. And uh, let's take a look at what a little bitty salmon fry has turned into by the time it's uh, come back up the Farmington River. These are a couple of adult Atlantic salmon in the viewing ladder of Rainbow Fishway. And uh, think about that. Uh, this is something that was six inches long when it went out to sea, lived on the natural resources of the open ocean, became a great big package of high quality protein, and then thousands of them would come back up the Farmington River. Um, and they're not the only fish that did that. Um, whoops, pardon me. <laughs> the, uh, the American shad is another anadromous fish, another migratory fish that does the same thing. They came up the Farmington River in their thousands. And once again, on the bottom there is a shad in the rainbow fishway. Same thing with the river herring, uh, the alewife and the blueback herring. Same thing with eels. And so the river was actually this huge funnel of protein from the ocean that supplied the people who lived inland on the rivers. And uh, that's where a lot of the value of riverfront land was uh, for the people who, who lived on the rivers. And so let's start with uh, Europeans first starting to colonize New England. And what did they find? Well, as you'll notice here, and, and by the way, this slide is from Laura Wildsman, um, who will figure a little bit later in this story. Um, as you'll notice, the early maps tended to be maps of the river systems. And in case you're having trouble recognizing New England here, it's because uh, north is on the right and south is on the left, and Cape Cod is hanging down towards the bottom of the picture. So the Connecticut River is actually uh, going across the top of this slide. And no matter how closely you look, you can't see the Farmington. <laughs> Apparently, it was not on a map of that period. Um, the Europeans might not have been using it yet, uh, but certainly the native people who were here 
used the Farmington and, and knew it very well. And if I may just um, stand up and point at a couple of things on this map, because it's not that clear. Um, if you take a look at Connecticut, um, and you take a look at the course of the Farmington River right here, um, you can see that there are some major Indian trails um, that go through that area, and there are a lot of Indian village sites um, in the vicinity of the Farmington River, and for good reason. Um, let's take a little bit of a closer look at what they were doing. Um, naturally, they were fishing. I mean, this was a, a major source of food for them. It was also a, a great way to travel. And um, also, the floodplain of the river was a really good place to farm. And, you know, we have to remember there was a lot of farming already going on in these river valleys by the time uh, Europeans got here. I mean, if you take a look, this, is, this example is mostly from the Connecticut River. But if you take a look at the names of towns along the Connecticut River, Northfield, Greenfield, Deerfield, Hatfield, Northampton, which was known as the Meadow City, Springfield, Westfield, Long Meadow, Enfield, Bloomfield, Weathersfield. Those fields were already fields under cultivation when the Europeans came. Unfortunately, most of them were largely out of use very, very quickly because um, the native people were dying off of disease. But it was cleared land, and it was, it was good floodplain land for farming. And the pictures over here on the right are uh, pictures of corn hills uh, from native cornfields that were still visible uh, in Northampton not too many decades ago. So, um, once again, if you take a look at archaeological sites um, in the Farmington River area, there are a lot of sites along the course of the Farmington. Um, and this, this circle here uh, refers to um, a study uh, done by Mark Banks uh, that compared um, known archaeological sites uh, and their characteristics to the characteristics of uh, just sort of random reference areas. And from that, uh, they were able to sort of pinpoint what made a good site for an Indian settlement. But I'm just going to go real quickly here through uh, some of the more notable archaeological sites. Um, there's one right down at the bend in the Farmington River. Um, actually, there are several down at the bend in the Farmington River in Farmington. Um, there are a couple of sites down there known as the Lewis Walpole site uh, and the Meadow Road site. And uh, those have artifacts that go back several thousand years. And you can find stone at that site that comes from nowhere near here. So uh, the intersection of trails down there was a major trade route for materials. Um, then there's the Indian Hill site, that's up above Terrafil Gorge, and I'll be talking more about uh, why that's such an interesting site later, but uh, just to say something quickly now, um, the fish migrations that came up the Farmington River hit a pinch point at Terrafil Gorge. It was a wonderful place to fish, and uh, not only for salmon and for shad and for herring, but also there was sturgeon coming up, and there are a lot of sturgeon remains at that site, and a lot of uh, fishing implements. Um, then near the intersection of Route 44 and 10, there's an area called Alsop Meadow. And uh, that also is a site that's several thousand years old. A uh, lot of stone tool manufacture there using uh, local materials. Um, and then uh, down by Fisher Meadow um, in Avon, right? Avon? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I had a glitch there. Um, there's not only... Um, trade sites, but also evidence of a settlement that looks like it was a fairly long-term settlement. So you've got people living there, you've got people traveling through, you've got people manufacturing things, you have trade going on. Uh, this was a very uh, important area. So I made reference to um, a study that tried to determine what made a great place for the natives to settle. Well, uh, flat land, loamy soil, somewhere on a river terrace or a river floodplain, and within 500 feet of water. Well, um, a good example of that is the meadows in Farmington, and by golly, that's uh, still a cornfield <laughs> growing there, um, kind of traditional. But um, it does kind of make you think about all the places that haven't been studied yet. There are a lot of places along the lower Farmington that have those characteristics that have not yet been examined. Um, so there could be a lot of great sites in Windsor, 
And um, it's something to keep in mind as uh, the floodplain in Windsor gets developed. Uh, you might want to be really careful to take a look for um, Native American uh, settlements before um, completely altering the landscape. So, um, enter Europeans. And uh, at first, the way the colonials used the river was uh, not that different from the way Indians were using the river. They were fishing, and again, fish was, was very valuable. Um, they netted fish, they uh, put up weirs the same way that Native Americans might have. Um, and this is just kind of a fun photograph of a weir still in use uh, as late as 1891, although it's not on the Farmington River, it's a great photograph. Um, and gradually, um, the Indian settlements uh, sometimes just sort of merged into uh, colonial sell settlements. And this is an example from elsewhere in Connecticut, but you, you'll recognize the names. Um, Mattatuck became Waterbury, Naugatuck uh, became Naugatuck, <laughs> or became Salem actually. Um, and Capage became, however you pronounce that, became uh, the Seymour and, and Humphreyville area. Um, and after a while, um, the names would change, but if you go back and look at the American uh, Indian River names, uh, which may be a little hard to read in the small type on this, on this screen right here, they usually describe either the physical characteristics of the, the site on the river or what uh, kind of fish they were catching on the river. So Androscoggin is the high fish place, Cabasiconti, the place where sturgeon abound, Penobscot, the rocky part, the descending ledge place, where the ro white rocks are, Presumpscot, river of many falls. Uh, never sink, that's kind of an interesting word because it sounds like an English word, but it's actually just a phonetic translation of an Indian word uh, that means uh, mad river, place of big rock, uh, something along those lines. Um, Naugatuck, lone tree by the fishing place, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and those, are, of course, are from uh, other places in New England. But here, uh, we get our uh, local place named Tunxis because Tunxis Cepus uh, referred to the bend of the Little River. And li the Little River was uh, one of the names by which the Farmington was known. So there it is. Um, but you know, we just couldn't leave the rivers alone. Um, and uh, Europeans started doing things on the river that the natives had not done. We're going to be talking about um, several different kinds of dams that are illustrated here. Again, I stole a slide from Laura Wildman with her permission. Um, the dams were there for a lot of reasons. Uh, for mechanically powered mills, uh, for navigation, uh, for other kinds of industry, ultimately for hydropower and for flood control. So, let's move on into the dam building era. Uh, that's where you start getting conflicts between dams and fish. Uh, because the first dams that were built, uh, the fish simply could not get past. And so you had uh, riverside landowners whose value in their land came from access to fish as well as the ability to farm. And yet you had uh, folks who were throwing dams across the river because their prosperity came from being able to use the river for power. And uh, some of these controversies went on for decades and even for centuries. And uh, Laura Wildman has an entire presentation on this, which is a, uh, really fascinating, as well as being a complete hoot the way she presents it. And um, it, you know, dams went up, they were blown up, they were taken down, there were legal battles, and it just went on and on and on, uh, uh, up to the point where someone actually uh, protested a dam by filling a cannon full of herring <laughs> and firing it. Um, and not having any idea what trying to fire a cannon full of herring would do to the cannon. Um, but I'll let Laura tell that story. <laughs> um, so um, this is actually just uh, kind of a good rendition of um, the next step after damming a river to provide a pond that would uh, power a mill that would provide mechanical power to a single operation. If you divert the whole river, you can get it uh, powering multiple mills. Um, and here's, here's a diagram of that. And uh, now we'll take a look at some of the Farmington River dams. Uh, one of the very earliest was the one down in Farmington at Tungsa Sipos, you know, the bend in the Little River, um, 
which is a gristmill dam that was put in in the 1640s, in the 1640s, in the 1600s. Um, I've listed a couple of other examples. There was a gristmill that was put in in Unionville in the 1760s. There's a gristmill here in uh, uh, Simsbury on Hopbrook in the late 1700s. Um, and that enabled uh, industry to develop here. Um, and again, this is a short list of many, many things that were manufactured in this area. Lumber, to tools and iron goods, carriages, textiles, paper products, lots of others. That's another whole presentation. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the painting over here that was done in the 1950s of that uh, first grist mill in Farmington, that grist mill was in operation as a functional dam uh, right up into the 1960s. Um, this was painted a little bit earlier, and I'd like to draw your attention to those pillars um, at the corner of the building of the slide and to the stepped structure on either end of the dam there. Um, so you can compare that to uh, what that same building looked like and that same mill site looked like in 2010. And of course, I, why did I have this tree branch in the way? I don't know. <laughs> but you can, you can still see the pillars at the corner of the building. That's the old mill race opening. And uh, you can still, if you're really good, you can still see the stepped structure on the wall at the very end of that dam. Uh, what, what is uh, partially missing here is the dam itself. Um, some of the top timbers have, have come off, but there is still enough of a dam uh, sitting there so that in low water it does uh, create a barrier uh, to some migration, migrating fish. Um, try to remember what a mill race looks like and the pillars that sit under the building in a mill race because there's a story coming later on. So um, there's another thing <laughs> that makes the grist mill dam uh, kind of an interesting uh, site in the Farmington Valley. And that is that the, uh, the film Way Down East uh, was filmed almost entirely elsewhere, except for one thing. Now, this is a six-minute diversion. I hope you can all uh, bear with this. It's kind of fun. So um, on the right, obviously, is Lillian Gish doing a very famous scene from Way Down East, where in despair, she's going out in the coals all by herself, and uh, she ends up flinging herself onto the ice of the river, and then the ice breaks up, and she's headed for a waterfall, and the man who loves her has to rescue her, and so on, just to give you a little bit of the setup. Um, and, you know, in those days, you had to find a real river and real ice blocks um, and risk your, your leading actors. Uh, so let's, let's see if we can just take some time out for this story. Okay, you may not be able to hear this. Yeah, maybe not. Can you hear in the back row? Okay. Face a real prison. Griffith saw the icicles forming and how heavy and snowbound my face was, all plastered with snow was melted. He wanted Billy to put it on film and he yelled to get that face and Billy said, I will if the oil in the camera isn't frozen. The camera was fitted with an acetylene heater since Bitzer had to cope with weeks of sub-zero temperatures. This was just one of the problems they had to solve in filming the ice flow scene, which would become one of the best remembered sequences in film history. The girl collapses onto the frozen river. Her lover, Richard Bartholomew, sees the ice break up and the girl heading for the falls. A location was chosen above the Hartford Dam near White River Junction, Vermont. However much he hated the cold, Griffith had no choice. The company spent weeks working on the ice. Men had to saw up the ice and when that didn't work, they blew it loose with dynamite. Sometimes the current was too strong, and the ice was swept beyond the bridge. Dorothy Gish came up to watch her sister's performance. Day after day at this Hartford location, Lillian Gish was obliged to lie on an ice floe in a thin dress. The scene was not even part of the original play. Griffith was probably inspired by a scene in Uncle Tom's cabin, Eliza's pursuit across the frozen river. 
Richard Marshall was encumbered by this raccoon coat, did many of the stunts himself, taking frequent drenchings. The cameraman stood on property ice floes made of wood. Lillian Gish often had to lie on real ones, trailing her hand in the water. Her ordeal became more than she could stand. She just said she couldn't take any more of it. That's all. She was completely frozen. She said, I'm chilled all through. I don't know as I'll live. I'll have pneumonia, she says. On one of the few occasions in her career, Lillian Gish agreed to a double, and then Griffith was equally demanding of her. I was sitting there all upset, and they were starting to take pictures, and he'd come back to check. Oh, no, that's wrong, all wrong. He says, all wrong. I remember him hearing it, yelling, all wrong. Face the other way. Got to face it. The way the ice was coming. So, had to do it all over again. Get right on the other side. And then I was getting disgusted with him. <laughs> Thought he was crazy, he didn't know what he wanted himself. Catherine Johnston was a Vermont girl, used to harsh conditions, but trailing her hand in the water like Lillian Gish proved too much. Just a few minutes of that would practically freeze your hand off after you took it out and get chill brains, you know, it was horrible. You then you get it warmed up a little bit and when it started to come through it would ache and hurt terribly. I can still feel it. Catherine Johnston spent just one memorable day on the picture. Lillian Gish had to spend day after day on the freezing ice until Griffith was satisfied. Griffith returned to Mamaroneck while his assistant, Elmer Clifton, took charge of the crew for the final stage. The great ice break for which men were on hand day and night. At the first signs of the thaw, cameras were rushed into position. When the double for Barthelmist thought a stunt too dangerous, Elmer Clifton doubled the double. At the Hartford Dam, school children gathered to watch the rescue. We see the guy come in with his arms outstretched, try to rescue her. Well, that was really very exciting to see, but he didn't rescue her. <laughs> she went over the dam. <laughs> started crying. I remember that. It says, oh, there she goes, there she goes. They started to cry. Because us boys didn't cry. We didn't know what to make of it. They the truth. <laughs> the company had been trying out dummies for the long shots. At that time, we had no way of knowing if they were dummies or not. It was a long while afterwards before we'd come to that it was dummies. <laughs> Griffith rejected the dummies and used a more ingenious ploy. Here we go. During the summer, he went to Farmington, Connecticut, and using wooden ice floes and a mill race similar to this, he restaged the rescue with far less risk to the actors. Lillian Gish could now trail her hair in the water. And shots of a full Grist Mill Dam. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a long build-up for a, a short moment of glory, but I uh, thought it was kind of fun. Um, where they are in the removal of that dam is um, still, in, uh, still in the talking stages. Um, this dam changed hands recently, so now it, it belongs to Miss Porter's school. And they acquired it rather unexpectedly. You know, they, the opportunity came along and they just took advantage of it. And uh, so we talked to them fairly early on and said, you know, <laughs> we, we have a whole engineering design completed for altering that dam to allow fish passage. Uh, now that you're the owners of it, how do you feel about that? And they were very open to the idea, but they said, look, you know, we have so many things to deal with first in deciding what to do with the building and um, how to move forward with that. Can you just give us some time? So uh, we went back to them a year later and said, um, ready to talk yet? And um, we actually have started a conversation now. 
where uh, we've presented various options for improving fish passage at that dam. And I think it's going to be under discussion by the appropriate board or trustees or you know, whoever it is that's going to make that decision. And, um, and then I'm sure they'll be getting back to us. And we can talk about uh, how we can make it happen. I mean, we, the Farmington River Watershed Association does have some resources for helping move the project forward. Um, but it would be a significant project. You know, it would take some permitting and some more fundraising. Um, so inching forward slowly on, on that idea. And a decision yet to be made as to exactly which kind of fish passage we're going to do there. So anyway, uh, moving on from Lillian Gish and way down east, <laughs> uh, let's take a look at uh, some other well-known dams along the Farmington River. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, the, the Native American uh, fishing spots uh, tended to be important to the early colonists. Um, they also happen to be uh, often good dam sites because they are at pinch points along the river where the, the fish would concentrate um, in a narrow spot that may be near a fall. That's also a great place to put a dam. So looking at this aerial view of uh, the dams in Collinsville, um, you can see that uh, uh, on either side of the river and in the river right here, there is a lot of bedrock. And uh, that provides a foundation for the dam in the river channel. And it's also something that you can attach the dam to reliably on either side of the river. Um, so that, that works well. Um, so here you can see uh, where the dam is, where the bedrock is, and you can also see where the dam has been converted into uh, those water power canals, um, as, as was shown in that earlier diagram. So, uh, and here's a, a much more attractive photograph of the same thing. So you have this ancient fishing site that's been uh, converted into an industrial era mill complex, and there was a great deal of industry um, uh, in this area uh, at one time. So let's take a look. A uh, closer look um, at the dam, and sorry, I just skipped by that slide, but it's a scene that's familiar to you all. Another thing that was very interesting about the Collinsville Dam is not only that um, the river was being used for water power, but that the flow of the river was being controlled fairly early on. And the reason I have this satellite photo up here is that the uh, the yellow marker at the bottom of it is the um, location of the Collinsville dams. The little red marker up top is the location of Otis Reservoir up in Massachusetts. That's the impoundment that was being uh, used to release water on a regular schedule so that during the factory working day there was a reliable supply, predictable supply of water uh, coming down, coming uh, through the dam and being diverted through the mill complex. And of course now it's not being used that way. Uh, the other little photograph there is what Otis Reservoir looks like today. It's a, it's a recreational lake. Um, another uh, Farmington River related <laughs> construction of the time was the Farmington Canal, which actually didn't involve the Farmington River um, directly, um, but it ran alongside the Farmington River in, uh, in some places. And it, it basically it was a, uh, a roadway made of water. Um, and so you did have it doing kind of strange things like uh, passing across the Farmington River on trestles um, as if it were uh, some sort of a, a railway or a raised highway, but it was actually a canal full of water on trestles above the water. Um, and again, this is more than another whole program, uh, the story of the Farmington River Canal, it, the, the Farmington Canal, not the Farmington River Canal. and. Um, it actually um, assisted the industry that was being powered by the dams. Um, so all that manufacture uh, supposedly was going to be traveling where it needed to go on the Farmington Canal. Well, it was a great idea, um, and it was a great idea between about 1820 and about 1840, 1860, and uh, at that point uh, it just wasn't paying for itself, and the railroads had been built along the same routes. And so rail was just a, a better way to be moving all these manufactured goods that the, uh, the river's power was helping produce. Yep. A lot of the water is going to canal 
Yes, it did, and I'm glad you I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. Um, Yep. And then when he was down and came out up on uh, Tom Farm Road, yeah. he close to where the aqueduct was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, every now and then, somebody does a tour of the Farmington Canal, you know, does, does a road trip of the Farmington Canal. And um, it'd be great if, if we could do something like that in conjunction with one of the historical societies, uh, because it's a great story. So um, the. Uh, Farmington, remnants of the Farmington Canal can actually be seen along, is it uh, along Nod Road, right? Right here in Simsbury? Uh, across from the Hartford, too. Across from the Hartford, right. yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I figured I could get that information yeah. from all of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, another amazing piece of, of, uh, of engineering and construction from the era. Um, Here's another pinch point in the Farmington River watershed. Um, this is Terraville Gorge. And you know, looking at the left-hand side mm -hmm. of this satellite photo, you can see the river really meandering all over the place um, as it makes its way northward uh, through uh, Farmington, Avon, and Simsbury, right here uh, through Simsbury. And then it hangs a uh, right. And all of a sudden, there's a straight strip where that, that yellow arrow is. Um, and then it starts to meander around in Windsor again. Well, that straight spot is where it is cutting right through uh, Talcott Ridge. So it's cutting through a basalt ridge and uh, looks kind of like that, <laughs> okay? Um, so there's vegetation there, but on either side of the river uh, in Terrafield Gorge um, is bedrock. So, you know, what a resource if you're looking to harness a river for water power. Um, up at the head of the gorge, um, th there was a, a mill that I'll uh, show you in a moment. But going through the gorge and at the foot of the gorge it was a great place for uh, fishing for sturgeon, for salmon, for shad. And again, this is where the Indian Hill archaeological site was. Um, and here's the mill uh, up at the head of the gorge. Um, and, and just to, uh, as a reminder here, these mills, uh, when we say they were powered by water, it was actually mechanical power. You know, these, these were um, wheels that were converting the, the power of the rushing water into spinning gears and moving belts and powering machinery. And uh, if you've ever been to Hancock Shaker Village up in Massachusetts, they still actually have a shop that's run by water power. You can lift up a trap door on the floor and there's a brook going under the shop. And there are all these belts uh, uh, powering all of this machinery. Uh, it, it's sort of an ocean nightmare, but it's, it's really, really interesting to see. So in about 1825, um, there was a carpet mill um, at this site, at the head of Terrafield Gorge. And then uh, the mill changed hands and was used for uh, many things over the centuries, uh, over the centuries, uh, over the decades. And um, uh, its present use, of course, is to be the multi-purpose building called the mill at Terrafield. You know, so there's a restaurant there and a number of businesses, but nobody's using water power anymore. But uh, it still retains a lot of character. Okay, so now moving down to the end of the gorge, um, that's the site of Spoonville Dam. And here the sequence of, uh, of dam building, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm talking about Spoonville Dam first, even though it wasn't quite the first um, hydropower dam in this area. Um, but at the beginning of the hydropower era, uh, Spoonville Dam was a very impressive accomplishment. And if you take a look at the dam site, uh, there's bedrock on both sides. You can see some white water in the river right there. That actually marks the spot where there's a sill of bedrock across the channel. Great place if you're thinking of uh, a hydropower dam. And so they built a hydropower dam. And uh, that's what it looked like in 1899, uh, right when it was freshly completed. Uh, and you can see it was a, a really considerable dam. And the big concrete wall in the foreground here uh, has these two great big pipes coming out of it. This is on the downstream side, obviously. Those are the penstocks that uh, took water that was taken in above the dam and funneled it down to the powerhouse. And here you can see the big penstocks feeding into the powerhouse and inside the powerhouse were these big turbines. 
Uh, and they were generating power that was then being conveyed 11 miles to Hartford. And that was a big achievement in those days to be uh, sending hydropower that far. Um, so here it is from above. Uh, you can see the dam. You can see the intake to the penstocks. You can see the penstocks sneaking down to the powerhouse. And uh, the reason the, the uh, aerial photo is interesting is you can see that they excavated a channel for the tail race from the powerhouse. That wasn't originally part of, of the river's channel, but it's a permanent new feature of the river uh, and now not so new. Um, note the year on this slide. This is 1954. Um, then came 1955. And uh, at, actually, I'm going to back up just a second here, um, just to bring your attention to the fact that uh, at the Dodd Center at Yukon, there is an amazing set of photographs of uh, Terrafield Dam before and after um, the 1955 flood. And I can't possibly talk fast enough to keep up with these slides, but I'm just going to let you enjoy this sampling of what the dam looked like uh, when it was in full operation. Um, in fact, uh, right when it was being completed, there was a fairly significant flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here are the uh, penstocks, maybe in 1914. Okay. And there's a beautiful panoramic shot of the, of the entire operation. Um, the turbines again. There's some fun photographs here. Um, well, that's kind of fun in itself, right there. A cold snap. Um, and look at how less vegetated the banks were. This is what it looked like before the dam. Um, and uh, this is under construction. Okay, and this is just kind of fun. You could go fishing from the powerhouse. And uh, people did, <laughs> at least for this set of photographs right here. So you get the idea, um, you know, this, this was quite an engineering feat. Um, that may have been the, uh, the heavy rain right when the, uh, the flood was, uh, right when the dam was first completed. Um, and the dam held up to it very well. But we are coming upon the, uh, the flood of 1955 uh, somewhere soon. Here's the, uh, the power lines. There have been power lines at that site in the gorge for a long time now. Um, and of course, this was uh, the Hartford Electric Light Company. Okay, so that's what it looked like during the 1955 flood. And it wasn't the water so much as uh, what was being conveyed by the water that knocked the top of the dam off. Um, so you can see the extent of the destruction uh, after, the, uh, after the flood. The powerhouse was pretty much trashed. Um, the dam itself was no longer holding back the water the way it needed to be. Uh, there, there's the river cascading through the gap. There's uh, debris in the penstocks. Notice that wall is still there. The, uh, the flood didn't take out that big intake wall. Um, but after the uh, uh, flood and after uh, this site was cleaned up, the powerhouse was taken down, that wall was taken down, and that actually uh, created the gap in the dam uh, that the river flowed through for 50 years afterwards. So uh, let's take a look. Let's move on here. Uh, let's take a look at what the dam looked like uh, in 2010. So that big hole right there is where the intake wall was that was just dismantled. Uh, that low spot in the dam is uh, where the top of the dam got knocked off. And those big hunks in the foreground were the top of the dam that have been sitting downstream in the river ever since then and creating a real hazard for boaters, as a lot of people know. And I think practically everybody in this room has heard the story of the removal of Spoonville Dam at this point. So uh, we'll just <laughs> do it quickly. There. <laughs> okay. That's the removal of Spoonville Dam in 2012. Another whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so now the, the river in that area looks pretty much the way it did uh, back in the 1890s. Okay, so it's, uh, it's a pretty good uh, restoration. And these are two of the chief instigators. Um, on the left there is the infamous <laughs> or, or famous Laura Wildsman, uh, from whom I got some slides for this show. Laura was the chief engineer for the dam removal project. 
And standing next to her is Amy Singler, who works for American Rivers. And American Rivers was one of the organizations that uh, really pitched in to uh, help find the resources for the dam removal project along with FRWA. And there they are at the dam site, uh, swimming and looking really pleased with themselves. <laughs> Uh, and this is what the dam site looked like in 2013 uh, during uh, some fairly high water. That's Andy Kohlberg who uh, organizes or helps organize the uh, uh, Whitewater Triple Crown event, having a really great time on that wave that is right where the dam used to be. Uh, and here's a little shot of the Triple Crown. So um, that's one hydropower dam from the lower Farmington, but it wasn't the first. Uh, the very first uh, is one that you can't see most of the time because it's uh, underwater in Rainbow Reservoir. But this satellite photo uh, gives you kind of uh, a rare look at it. Uh, there was a drawdown in Rainbow Reservoir a few years ago and it exposed the old dam uh, known as the Oil City Dam. Um, its real name was to be the first Rainbow Dam. The name Oil City came from the fact that uh, right after oil was discovered in Pennsylvania and everybody was all excited about that, a uh, scam artist, a con artist, uh, came to this area, uh, poured some oil around on some rocks, <laughs> pretended to have discovered oil, got a lot of people so excited that they invested on the spot and he skipped town, um, and the, the area became nicknamed Oil City. Um, to people's embarrassment. So um, the Oil City Dam uh, is visible here. This is during the drawdown. You're actually looking at the old dam structure here that's usually underwater. Um, that was built around uh, 1890. The powerhouse burned in 1897, uh, which created a blackout in Hartford. And uh, um, subsequently they thought, well, maybe it would be good to you know, have, have some backup. And uh, not instantly, but uh, over the next set of years, uh, two other dams were built, hydropower dams. One was a little upstream of this, that was Spoonville Dam. And a little downstream of this, uh, the second Rainbow Dam was built, um, which you can see right here. Uh, and that was around 1925. Um, I have an interesting story from uh, Steve Geppard, one of the DEP fisheries biologists about the, uh, the shop that was associated, the workshop that was associated with this dam originally. Um, it was in an old woolen mill a little bit downstream. You know, they, there were old mill buildings everywhere. Um, and so they, they had the shop uh, uh, in the old woolen mill, but then they built a shop, uh, especially for uh, maintenance at Rainbow Dam. And uh, Kurt or anybody else, you can supplement the story or correct it if I'm not getting it quite right. Uh, but apparently there was someone associated with the power company who, when they knew that the, the old woolen mill needed to be uh, taken down because it was no longer going to be used, he didn't want to pay for someone to take the building down. So one day he himself just threw a chain around the um, mill race, around the pillars of the mill race, hitched it to his tractor and put the tractor in reverse. Now think about this. You're pulling an old mill building toward yourself <laughs> with a tractor <laughs> that's got a chain wrapped around the mill race pillars. And um, apparently the mill did come down on, on this guy, but he survived it. So it's just a funny story instead of a tragic one. So um, let me back up here. The uh, show is advanced a little too quickly. Hello, can we back up? There we go, okay. So, moving forward, <laughs> um, one of the structures that's been added to Rainbow Dam uh, in the 1970s was a fish ladder, because now we really do want to get the fish back up uh, the Farmington River, and at least to some degree restore that great natural resource. So the fish ladder that was built uh, on Rainbow Dam looks like this from above, and if you happen to be a shad, now uh, watch my mastery of high technology here, if you happen to be a shad <laughs> swimming up the river, <laughs> what you need to do when you get to the base of the dam is uh, be persuaded to take a U-turn 
and start going up that fish ladder, which is that sequence of uh, black squares there. Uh, each square is a chamber that the fish has to get up into that's a foot higher than the chamber before it. And that takes a little bit of ingenuity um, because shad take their cue from the way the current is moving. And so you have to generate a current that convinces them that they actually should do that kind of a turn and uh, go up the ladder instead of just bonking their noses against the base of the dam. And there's a bit of an art to that. So um, this is what the fish ladder looks like on the ground. And you can see the chambers um, sloping upward like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, shad don't really like to do this sort of thing, and they're not particularly good at it. Uh, so ultimately, uh, a better way to get the shad up uh, and over Rainbow Dam would be with a fish lift. And uh, hopefully something like that can be installed at some point. Um, if it is, then uh, the shad will be able to extend their breeding range again uh, from Terrafil Gorge, or just below Terrafil Gorge, uh, all the way up to the Collinsville dams. And that's a pretty significant chunk of river. Uh, so it'd be great to be able to, uh, to restore that. But as you can see from the red lines going all the way up through Massachusetts and um, uh, into Vermont and New Hampshire, um, there is still a pretty good shad run um, in other rivers of, of New England. Okay, those were the power dams. Now, what about the water supply dams? Uh, the Farmington River has a particularly interesting history when it comes to um, water supply. Um, originally, the water supply for Hartford came from the Connecticut River, and then it came from some uh, reservoirs that were relatively close to Hartford. But the really great source of really great water for Hartford was identified as the Farmington River. Um, and if you take a look at a map like this, it's tremendously confusing. So I'm going to take out the tributaries so that you can see the main stem. Um, and now you can see the major impoundments on the Farmington River. And not all of these are water supply, but this is just to give you an idea of how many significant impoundments there are in the Farmington River watershed. Otis Reservoir, Coldbrook River, West Branch, Barkhamstead, McDonough, and Nepog. So how did they all get there? We're going to start with Nepog Reservoir. Um, that was built in about 1916. And uh, my dates here are a little bit squishy, so people can, can correct me if they want. Sometimes it's the date that the reservoir was started. Sometimes it's the date that it was completed. But this is Nepog Reservoir um, under construction. Um, and there it is as a beautiful finished structure. Uh, not the reservoir, the dam. <laughs> it's a beautiful fi finished structure. Um, and this is what it looks like from above. And this is what it looks like from uh, right on the water. That was intended to be uh, a water supply reservoir for Hartford, but there was a political and economic issue with taking the Nepog River and not letting it discharge into the Farmington anymore. You know, it's an important tributary to the Farmington. And there were people downstream of where the Nepog River came in saying, well, wait a second, we have water rights. We're entitled to a certain amount of water in the Farmington River that we can use for power or for irrigation or for whatever. There were, there were owners of water rights downstream of this. And they were saying, if you just grab the Nepog River and impound it, what happens to our right to a certain amount of flow in the river that we need? Well, the answer to that was to take another tributary, actually uh, uh, the east branch of the Farmington River, and put what's called a compensating reservoir on it. So that's where Lake McDonough, or Compensating Reservoir, came from. This is how it looks uh, from a satellite. Um, this is a little bit closer look at it. This is a dam across the east branch of the Farmington that was intended to, for release of water into the main channel um, in the event that people's water rights needed to be fed with water, you could do controlled releases from the compensating reservoir. It compensated for the cutting off of Nepog Reservoir and the consumption of water from, from that reservoir. And uh, here again, uh, this is looking at it from uh, above and upstream. Um, and then uh, it seemed like a really good idea to take the east branch above compensating reservoir or Lake McDonough and make that into a drinking water reservoir because after all, Hartford was growing and its need for water was increasing. So hey, take the whole East Branch. So um, this was once part of the river, 
Um, it's now a drinking water reservoir. Um, this is what it, uh, the dam looks like. Uh, this is Seville Dam um, at the uh, lower end. And it's a beautiful structure uh, if you take a look at it up close. Um, here it is under construction uh, in 1938. Um, you might recognize um, some of the familiar features right now. Um, this is looking at it from the spillway. Um, and this is what it looks like now. Okay, so uh, kind of a before and after. And uh, again, both of these are, uh, no, they're not both dated 1938. That's, uh, ignore that caption, that's from the previous photo. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, Bark Hampstead Reservoir uh, remains uh, part of the major uh, portion of the drinking water supply for Hartford. If you ever get a chance to tour inside Seville Dam, it's an incredible uh, tour. Um, there is a, uh, an old hydro uh, turbine inside that dam um, that is uh, really interesting to see. Okay, so you never know how big Hartford's gonna get. <laughs> so why not put a drinking water reservoir on the West Branch as well? And from a drinking water engineering point of view, I mean, this was an incredible watershed to work with. Um, we're the Watershed Association, so you know w we have other views of what uh, rivers are good for, but you have to admit, this was an incredible water supply. So uh, the Metropolitan District Commission, which was the water utility who was um, uh, creating these water supplies, uh, wanted to put a dam on the Upper West Branch as well for future drinking water supply. Well, uh, this was already an idea that was underway um, at the time of uh, the 1955 flood. Um, here you can see um, Hogback Dam, also known as um, Goodwin Dam, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I deal with so many dam names uh, in, the course of, uh, <laughs> in the course of this, I kind of lose track of where I am. Um, so Hogback Dam, Goodwin Dam is, is right here. And the West Branch Reservoir uh, looks like this. This is uh, looking at it over the spillway at a time when it's very, very full. Um, but you'll notice if you look across that expanse of water, sure looks like a man-made structure up at the other end of it. And uh, there's a reason for that. And that is that the, uh, the same uh, stretch of valley that was gonna work really well as a drinking water reservoir also happened to be a really good place to plunk a dam if you were interested in flood control. Um, so let's talk about flood control dams for a second here. Um, before I get into this, I'm gonna do a little caveat. There are flood control structures all over the Farmington watershed that I'm not going to talk about at all, but I am gonna talk about uh, this big one. Um, and it was built, as many of the flood control, control structures were, in response to a major disaster, which was the 1955 flood. This is uh, Main Street in Winstead uh, during the 1955 flood. Um, here is Main Street in Winstead after the water drained away. That's, that's actually the street. Um, and here is what was left of Collinsville, uh, the railroad bridge in Collinsville after the 1955 flood. Again, this is another whole presentation. <laughs> Um, but it was a major, major destructive event. And afterwards, uh, the political pressure was there uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers to start building flood control structures in the upper Farmington Valley. And here's a closer look at that dam that I showed you that was up above um, West Branch Reservoir. This is Colebrook River Dam. And if you jump up into the air really high and look at it from above, this is what it looks like. And people often uh, comment on, gee, I went past the reservoir and it's half empty. Well, that's because this is a flood control reservoir. The point is to keep it partly empty because its function is to accommodate water flowing into it rapidly during storm events. And so the level of this reservoir is very closely watched and, and um, very proactively controlled and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and Metropolitan District Commission coordinate uh, every single week on the amount of water that's gonna be released from Colbert River Reservoir down into West Branch Reservoir and then down into the Farmington River, uh, the West Branch of the Farmington River. 
um, which is in another whole presentation. So um, here you see it um, from above. Uh, this is standing on the edge of Colebrook River Lake when it is actually full. Um, so at this point, there would probably be active discharge uh, happening down into West Branch Reservoir to bring this lake level down, even though it looks beautiful this way. Um, you don't want to keep it that way. You want to empty it for the next flood. Okay, so to review class, <laughs> we'll take out the tributaries, look at the uh, major impoundments again. So Otis Reservoir, um, as early as the 1860s, there were releases uh, from that reservoir to power the mills in Collinsville. Nipog Reservoir, around 1916. Uh, compensating Reservoir, uh, Lake McDonough, around 1920. Uh, followed by Barkhamstead Reservoir, 1931. Actually, you just saw the picture of it under construction in 1938, so it was, it was actually finished about a decade later. Um, and then West Branch Reservoir in 1960, that's a uh, possible future water supply for Hartford. Uh, and then the uh, Colebrook River, River Reservoir for flood control uh, in 1969. Notice how far up in the watershed Colebrook River Reservoir is. Um, we do need to keep in mind that 80% of the watershed drains into the Farmington River below that flood control reservoir, okay? So while it does make a significant difference in controlling uh, flood flow in the river, there's still a lot of watershed draining into the river uh, in a major flood event, and it's certainly not uh, taking care of all of that. Just want to have a little reality check there. I'm not really going to talk about... <laughs> I'm not really going to talk about all the wastewater treatment plants, although that's another whole presentation. <laughs> um, really, uh, where we are right now, um, and, and you'll notice I've talked mostly about the dams on the Farmington River, uh, we're really now in, in an era where we're trying to reconcile that conflict between the original great resource of the river, which was um, the anadromous fish, that provided such a, a wonderful um, natural resource to uh, people in the River Valley, um, trying to reconcile that with the fact that we've uh, created all these barriers on, on the river. Um, how, do we, how do we get the two working side by side? Well, one thing we can do is we can get rid of obsolete dams that aren't going to be used anymore. Um, another thing we can do is retrofit existing dams with ever better fish passage. Um, and any new resources um, are constructed in such a way that you really can have a shad run uh, or a herring run, or maybe if we're incredibly lucky, uh, someday even a salmon run uh, again. So these are uh, shad in some other river <laughs> looking the way we would like the shad to look in our river. And I will mention, by the way, that May 24th is World Fish Migration Day <laughs> and uh, we are celebrating it here in Connecticut because there has been so much fish passage restored in recent years, um, including the removal of uh, Spoonville Dam. So if you would like to observe World Fish Migration Day on um, May 24th, come and join me at Spoonville Dam um, from 10 to 12. We'll be there uh, pointing out uh, some of the uh, old features of uh, the old dam and the old hydro plant, uh, talking about the removal of Spoonville Dam. And at that, on that very same day, there's gonna be an open house at Rainbow Dam so that you can tour the fish ladder. Um, so it could be an exciting day for you. <laughs> and uh, just sort of give you a glimpse of uh, hopefully things to come on the Farmington River. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you and take questions. Thanks for listening. I feel so silly with uh, all my fellow committee members here. <laughs> I should be sitting with you. Well, they, uh, one, one thing that always fascinates me, and I don't yeah. know if it, Wesleyan did a study uh, maybe 25, 30 years ago, yeah. that the Farmington, the Connecticut at one time was a tributary of the Farmington. Of oh, the Farmington? Hmm. Yeah, and that, okay. uh, that was pre Talcott Ridge explosion. And the Farmington flew yep. straight down and joined the, the Connecticut joined the Farmington in Middletown, where the Middletown takes that turn right at the yep. restaurant. Yep. And then Talcott Ridge decided to erupt 
it blocked off the Farmington, yeah. and that's why the Farmington meanders all the way back, and then when it finally found an opening up at the gorge, yeah. it went down and rejoined the Connecticut, and so the, it always has been said that the Farmington is, was a tributary, and it is today a tributary to the Connecticut, but at one time, way back when, and I don't exactly remember what time it was, the Connecticut was a tributary of the Farmington. Yeah, well, if it was before the, the uh, basalt, before the top really exploded. A while ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I always found it fascinating. Yeah. And, that they, and they actually did drilling and borings all the way down through Berlin, and, and they proved that the Farmington River did, in fact, go down that way. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, apparently, the, the reason uh, Terrafield Gorge exists is because there was a point at, at which the Farmington was backed up. Mm -hmm. In, in what's now called the bathtub, is that, yeah. that big uh, flat valley between uh, Farmington and Terrafil. Right. Um, and the first place it was able to spill over the ridge was Terrafil, right. and then it just cut down through yeah. the ridge yeah. uh, as time went on. Because you look at the Farmington on the map, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, unless you know the, the geological history, which luckily for you, I didn't try to cover. <laughs> <laughs> That's another. <laughs> it's another presentation. Yeah, the Jabor would say that it goes through a fault in the ridge. Does it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that's why it went through there, is there was already... Oh, so it didn't really have to cut down through the basalt. Basalt the whole way. There yeah. Was a fall yeah. There. Mm. yeah. And uh, Yellow Jabor can really talk about this uh, in a way that we can only dream about. Yeah. There is a book that I read as a child called uh, Flood Friday by Lois Lenski that is about the flood in Winstead and the, the 55 hurricane. Really? Yes. And it describes houses floating down the river. And there's a child who's in one of the upstairs rooms in one of these houses that are headed downstream. That's great. Right. It's, it's an old book. I must have read it like in fifth grade or something. Yeah, I remember it was old. We were down in Torrington a couple of years ago, and I think we were in the library that they had pictures. I mean, it, had, it was amazing. It did a number on Torrington, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. huge yeah. number on Torrington. The yeah. same thing, you see, sort of before and after. CP yeah. TV had yeah. uh, sure. an hour long show yeah. that they put on periodically around yeah. August. Yeah. And it's about the, what had happened because the flood, the majority of the flood took place from say about 12 o'clock till dawn. And yeah. there was no lights and no, the way they photograph today. Yeah. And so they have a lot, they don't have an awful lot of uh, pictures of the river when it was at its <laughs> highest. Uh, the Farmington, I, I wasn't in the Farmington, but I was in Plymouth and the Naugatuck, and I remember all the rivers there flooding over, and, and it was just uh, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that that does a pretty good job of showing the devastation. Unionville was just totally, there are places oh, in Unionville, gone. if you yeah. take a chance, there are markers that show the mm -hmm. water, right. and they're 50 feet deep spots. Yeah. And what had happened, what you said, the reason the dams, the flood happened because of what, all of, people used to throw everything into the rivers. Yeah. Tree stumps, cars, you name it, went into the yeah. rivers. All that debris started coming down the river. The first bridge it came to, it started backing up. Next thing you know, you got a dam. And now the water's backing up, backing up. And finally, the pressure got so great, the, dam, the bridge let go. And then this wall of water comes down the river, and that's what caused all the damage. With a bridge in it, yeah. And that was in Farmington. It was like 50, 60 feet. And that bridge didn't let go. It went around both sides of the bridge in Unionville. It's yeah. one thing that bridge's still there. Yeah. There's one of the few bridges that didn't let go. Yeah, but it cut off Unionville completely. Oh, yeah, both sides, because it, it, it went around the bridge. Yeah. Once the wall got so high. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it, it, it's really an adventure once you start uh, looking at the historical material for this. Um, I, you know, what, more often when the Watershed Association does a, a, a program on the history of the river, we're talking about the history of river pollution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what used to be put into the river and then how, how that was dealt with. And uh, we didn't even get to that <laughs> in this uh, presentation. There's, there's just so much history um, on the river because it's so central to all of these communities. So, uh, you know, stay tuned. Maybe we'll have a 12-part series. <laughs> so, uh, Fascinating. But yeah, it, it really is. And uh, maybe some of you don't know this, but uh, Walt and I actually did a West Branch tour a few years ago uh, for a group that was in town on a conference. And um, I, it was, it was, uh, the most wonderful trip. I learned as much from Walt on the tour as uh, probably most of the people on that tour bus did because of uh, all the history of the 55 flood. Yeah. So, anyway. 
Um, any any great anecdotes about Rainbow Dam that you want to share, Kurt? <laughs> well, I understand that the on top of the dam we had that, that six foot high flood control yeah. wood. Yeah. And that was the only time we lost all 400 feet of that flood control area was during the 55 flood. Oh, it just blew it right and, off. Uh, yep. And the dam itself held, but we had water on both sides of that dam. Wow. And uh, that was the only time that ever happened. So. Wow. Wow. That's that's really interesting. Uh, during I think it was Hurricane Irene. Um, uh, I heard from Tim Anthony afterwards. Uh, Tim controls releases from West Branch Reservoir uh, uh, at the MDC. And he was saying that uh, if it weren't for the flood control structures up on the West Branch, there would have been another uh, 19,000 cubic feet per second coming down the river, uh, which is a good thing to have avoided. <laughs> Um, and now, of course, it gives rise to a, a certain amount of mystery. We'll have a, a heavy precipitation event, and people will watch the river crest, and then, you know, watch the, the flood event go by, and then the next day the river is still high, and the day after that the river is still high, and the day after that the river is still high, and that's about when we start getting phone calls. And we have to explain, well, that's because now they're emptying Colbrook River Reservoir <laughs> because of all the, the water that it caught. You have to get it... Uh, and down the river uh, over a long period of time. The dam, can, they can hold back quite a bit of water because being a trout fisherman on opening day of trout season, sometimes the water is so high in the Farmington that they do close that dam at midnight. Yeah. And it's amazing to go by on Friday and the, the river is way up and then they close it at midnight. And by the time trout season opens at six o'clock in the morning, it's down yeah. to a relatively normal level. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty high, yeah. but it's, it's fishable. And they announced over the loudspeakers that as of noon, they're opening the dam back up again. <laughs> so oh, get up. don't be in water up to your waist because <laughs> pretty soon you'll be ready. Yeah, so don't get your waders filled. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's a, it, those flood control dams really, it, they keep talking about the potential of a 100-year flood, but the, the conditions that it happened in 55, I don't think could ever happen again. They, they were pretty extreme. Um, yeah. uh, but we are seeing... Uh, a fairly steady increase in total precipitation every year now, mm -hmm. um, and and who knows who knows how far it's going to go, and an increase in the amount of rain that's happening in storm events, um, and the intensity of the rain in storm events. So there's still potential for exciting things to happen on the river, <laughs> and um, and there are a lot of people trying to be proactive about that, uh, including FRWA. We're working with some partners um, to take a look at culverts all around the watershed. Um, and identify culverts that, uh, we're interested in culverts that are bad at passing aquatic animals and how they could be uh, made better for that. But at the same time, you're getting information about what culverts might really uh, be creating a risk in a flood event because they're inadequate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're hoping to be in conversations uh, with towns about, you know, maybe tackling both of those problems together in some spots. And I know we have a meeting to get to, so um, I'm going to try to discipline myself and stop talking here so that we can move on to the next step. But thanks a lot. For, Thank you. Uh, Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.